Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm not Emily Maxson. <laughs> so I proposed this episode to Emily a while back, and when we actually got around to scheduling it, scheduling it she told me that I was hosting it. So I'm David Maxson, uh, better known around these parts as the lawfully wedded husband. <laughs> Greg is still here, along with our friends, David and David. <laughs> Since there are three Davids, and we're all new on here, we're going to do a round of introductions in a moment. And then after that, we're going to be talking about science and mathematics, and really the beauty of God's handiwork as it's woven throughout the universe, and, and everything that we look at, and everything that we touch, and everything that we see and think about. I have no particular idea what exactly we're going to be digging into, I anticipate black holes and imaginary numbers showing up somewhere around here. <laughs> but whether or not you're interested in mathy stuff or sciencey stuff, I hope you'll stick around and hang out with us. Our goal is really here to wonder at the majesty of God. Um, we're not here about competing on Star Trek trivia because Greg would already win that competition. <laughs> I don't know. David Farshman would give me a run for my money for sure. <laughs> I would at least attempt to compete. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so some quick introductions. I'll start with David Farshman. So David was a student of Greg's back in the day and the father of one of my childhood friends. So go ahead, share your background. What's your formal education and career, your general passions, and then a brief summary of your coming to Christ? Well, my formal education is uh, that I attended Shasta College. I keep mentioning Shasta College or will mention it simply because being a community college, it was nevertheless extremely formative because I had um, several fantastic teachers there. In fact, um, two of the best math teachers that I had um, were there, and uh, they directly guided me into going from being a German major when I really had no skill um, <laughs> in German at the time into being a math major. I uh, moved on to UC Davis to complete my bachelor's in science. And then uh, being a little lazy, I stayed at UC Davis to get my master's in science, uh, which I completed uh, in 1991. Uh, from that point on, I have been at various times uh, teaching in the community college level, usually. And I've taught at a wide variety of community colleges, being a road warrior um, for <laughs> some time um, as a part-time teacher. Uh, however, I eventually found my way to Pasco Scientific, a company that manufactures equipment for teaching physics and science, mm -hmm. and uh, ended up being uh, a software engineer, enterprise system software engineer that keeps the company running. But at the same time, I have been teaching at Sierra College a uh, variety of classes. Most recently, there were uh, integral calculus was the last one I was getting to teach. So cool. I feel like the transition from math technology is something. It, um, <laughs> it, the mathematics provided the logical reasoning and the uh, strict methodologies that allowed me to jump over to programming with relative ease. So it proved a uh, very good point of study. Uh, and then what was the next thing that I was supposed to... Uh, You're coming to Christ. Um, I didn't come to Christ. <laughs> I was captured kicking and screaming and dragged to Christ, despite having, by God's grace, been raised in a Christian... Uh, household. Nevertheless, coming to know God's word uh, and coming to submit myself to what God's word said, as opposed to what I, in my better judgment, thought it should be saying, <laughs> took a little bit of time and patience. And in God's grace, God gave me an excellent teacher who refused to answer many of my questions. Uh, <laughs> and uh, instead, uh, forced me to have to uh, dig for myself. So arguably, I came to Christ before I have memory of coming to Christ, or I came to Christ when I was four years old, or I came to Christ when I was 16. But definitely, I came to Christ when he reached out, seized me by the heart and drew me to him. 
And after that, there, I can go with whatever version of coming to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, the other one I forgot was uh, general passions outside of career and education. Uh, my general passions uh, include uh, storytelling, reading, archery, particularly recurve archery using the Mongolian <laughs> release um, with the hope of someday using it with my other passion, which is horseback riding. Um, I have hopes of Ambitious. being able to combine the two sports into one uh, as opportunity provides itself. Hence the Mongolian hold. Yes. release. A Mongolian release. Hmm. Much easier to shoot on the uh, right side of the bow for a right-handed person who is also right-eyed. <laughs> I struggle being right, right-handed right and left-eyed. Um, so is Joseph, and uh, I have him shooting the Mongolian release off of the left side of the bow. <laughs> and suddenly, where he seemed to not be able to hit the side of a barn with his fist, <laughs> he can now hit targets with a bow. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty. All right. Next we have David Lawrence. So David Lawrence is the elder at my church, is uh, specifically our care elder, and runs a study of Psalms and uh, evening fellowship that we've been part of for several years and has been a good friend to us uh, while we're here on the East Coast. So same questions to you, David. Uh, your formal education and career, your general passions, and a brief summary of to just to spite David Farshman, you're coming to Christ. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, formal education. Well, as I was saying earlier, it kind of got started when I was four years old and decided I wanted to be an astronaut. And um, <laughs> I was pretty single-minded in wanting to do that. I grew up on the Apollo program. And, you know, <laughs> seeing these guys walk around the moon, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, so... I have bad eyesight, so being a pilot was out of the question. And you know, talked to some folks and said, "Well, go be a scientist." So uh, I uh, went and was a physics major at Texas Christian University. Kind of follow my father; he was also into physics, but with always the goal of you know, what can I do to get into space? I thought that was just the neatest thing. Ended up getting my PhD in physics at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, where we ended up flying high altitude balloons, about a 2,000 pound payload to measure galactic cosmic rays from the top of the atmosphere. We took it up to northern <laughs> Canada in the tundra of, wow. you know, nothing's there up there except for <laughs> balloons that fall from the sky. Uh, <laughs> And it was really cool because, you know, that was a program as a grad student. You actually got to put all the hardware together and do the whole thing. And I applied to astronaut program, never got in. That was a great blessing. But since that time, I've uh, had an over 20-year career uh, working on spaceflight hardware. Uh, started out at Los Alamos National Lab uh, back in 96. Uh, spent 13 years there. And then uh, the Lord uh, dragged us kicking and screaming to Maryland uh, because he knew there was uh, uh, good opportunities here. And I've since been here for over a decade at a place called Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and still working, doing spaceflight stuff. And essentially what I do, what we, you know, uh, worked on many different missions, uh, but we use uh, gamma rays and neutrons that come, that are emitted off of planetary bodies to measure their elemental composition. So basically, what is the moon made of? What is Mercury made of? And so I've uh, been involved with missions to the moon and Mercury and Mars, measuring water on the moon, water on Mercury. <laughs> and uh, right now I'm involved in three different builds uh, for three different missions. One is a, a mission, a NASA mission called Psyche, and it's going to uh, be a spacecraft that orbits an asteroid called Psyche that we think is metal rich. Second one is a Japanese mission uh, called Martian Moons Exploration, and it's going to orbit a moon, uh, one of the Mars moons called Phobos and measure, try to figure out how it was formed. And then finally, kind of cool, is there's uh, APL, where I work, is actually got selected for a mission of about a year and a half ago to fly a quadcopter to Saturn's moon Titan. It has a super thick atmosphere. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, I can talk more about that, but it's, it's, it's really wacky and crazy and it just might work. <laughs> Passions. I love space. I think it's awesome. Uh, I always have. I'm very into my family. We have uh, six kids, a uh, very busy household. Right now, it feels like it's, it's work and family and church. Um, I love reading. I love history. I love biographies. At best, I'm an amateur theology. I, I cannot count myself as any expert. Goats and I love chickens. sports. Goats and chickens. And my, <laughs> my older sons have gotten me into Premier League. And so it's a regular thing to watch Premier League highlights. Uh, you know, the proper name of the sport, of course, is football, not soccer. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. So enjoy that. <laughs> yes. So that about covers it. I like all sorts of things. I, I, I love talking theology and science and philosophy. You know, a good conversation is fabulous. Uh, coming to Christ, I grew up in a, a Christian household, a Presbyterian, but there was probably a lot of wandering around. Uh, the other, David, your story uh, kind of resonates with me, but the timing's a bit different. Um, I think where, where the Lord really grabbed me by the scruff of the neck was when I was in graduate school hmm. uh, with a whole load of different things going on. I'm in a graduate program with a whole lot of materialists and really struggling. How do you deal with miracles? How do you think about you know all these things in the Bible? And then I stumbled upon C.S. Lewis. And I think, you know, he's a literature guy, but for me, he was one of the most scientifically minded persons that I could have read at the time because of the way he made sense of things and the way he made sense of the Bible. And mm -hmm. it was a combination of reading mere Christianity, miracles, great divorce, a whole load of other things and other personal things going on that, you know, I was just smit smitten and with the Lord and, you know, haven't looked back. Cool. Um, next we have Greg Eininger. Now, if, if you as a listener have been, have heard any other episodes, you've heard Greg, um, he's the uh, centerpiece of this show, but since the rest of us are new, I'm making Greg do his introductions too. So Greg, would you share with us your, your background, your education, um, as well? Um, I think we, you know, you, you've been a teacher, you were my teacher, you were Emily's teacher, you were David Farshman's teacher, and, you know, there's a long, long legacy there. But what, what got you launched into that? And, um, yeah, I guess what, what got you started into all of that? David and I both started uh, in a small Christian school, North State Schools in Anderson, California. And um, my four years there, in my four years there, I took one semester of physical science. That was it. It's all the science I had. And it was largely, there was a section on chemistry and valence electrons that was just enough to see me through Chem A, bonehead chemistry, uh, at Shasta College I also went to. Somewhere along the line, I thought, huh, Christian schools aren't great on science. Mm -hmm. There were a number of reasons I declared myself a physics major. Most of them, I think they were all bad. Uh, but one that God, one that God used was, well, if nothing else, you can go back to the school you graduated from and you can, among other things, teach science. I knew I would never teach myself physics, chemistry, or calculus. So I figured I needed someone to teach me these things. History, lit, English, I, I, I was fine there. I, I can read. But the detailed skills of, of math and science were beyond me. But I'd always been interested in science. I like David Lawrence, I, I grew up in the shadow of the Apollo program. I remember Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. And, you know, like every other little kid, when I was five or six, I'm going to be an astronaut. Well, David <laughs> Lawrence actually pursued it. I didn't. <laughs> Wouldn't have mattered. My eyesight's bad, too. Um, so anyway, went to Shasta, graduated as a um, uh, physics major with a math minor, and then went on to a uh, little Christian Reform College in Northwest Iowa. And at that time, I was getting burned out on college because I'd already spent three years to make up for the non-science education I had had. And I was tired. So I declared myself an education major because, hey, I'm going to go teach, right? So that that knocked off the number of math science courses I had to teach. Graduated. Um, originally, the plan was master's and doctorate. No, I was tired. <laughs> so I went back to a little small school. And for as long as the school stayed open, I taught all kinds, all levels of, of high school math and both chemi chemistry and physics 
to whoever needed to take them. When the school closed, came here to Sacramento and was hired to do similar things. But little by little, we got other people who were as competent or more so than I was. And so now I teach physical science. I teach an algebra class and I teach chemistry and um, spend most of my time teaching other things to the point that when people uh, ask about it, they say, so you're a history major, right? No. Theology major? No. What are you? I'm a physics major. What? Yeah, I, know, I know. It doesn't show very well. Uh, what are you? <laughs> Just but goes to show that you can do anything with physics, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I love mathematics more than physics. Um, it, there's a puzzle quality. So you're going you're gonna to ask about passions. Puzzles of all sorts, chess, but particularly British mystery stories of the cozy variety. <laughs> I like to read storytelling. What David didn't say bluntly was uh, role playing in the old fashioned, where you actually sit around with a bunch of people and play out a story. Uh, David, by the way, is fantastic at orchestrating background music so that it, the music hits just the right place at the right time in the right story. And it's spending true. time with my three girls. Gifts that God gives. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, also, I'm also <laughs> which reminds me, I'm a, I also direct theater now and then. Oh no, uh, <laughs> which which became really difficult last year with COVID. Um, yeah. Coming to Christ, well, you, you've already said it. I was I grew up in a Christian, more or less Christian. Home. My mom was a devout lady, although quiet in her faith. My dad had grown up in the church, but wasn't involved. And through through this the Christian school I was in, through my mom, through our church. And particularly through good evangelical preachers on Christian radio, someplace mm. in my teenage years, I finally understood the gospel. Mm. You know, so like David, I could say, "Well, I came to Christ at name a point, but the time when it became most conscious, when God really convicted me of my sins and showed me, yeah, good being good ain't it." it was somewhere probably in junior high, uh, and um, as as David Farshman also said. And you can cite numerous other times when God grabbed a hold of me and said, no, nah, not that way, this way. No, that's not faith. Get with it here. You need more faith. So, yeah, it's been an ongoing process today. I continue to work for a small Christian school. It's a little bigger than what I came from. And I do ghostwriting on theology projects. And uh, I've mentioned before Heirloom Audio. If you've never been there and seen the stuff they do, I have a hand in that. really small hand, but it's a great ministry that tells stories about historical characters based on uh, G.A. Hinty's novels. So there's some cool. of what I do. And this podcast. Yeah. Which was not my yeah. idea, by the way. David and Emily came to me and said, we've listened to all your stuff online. Can we do something together? Okay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll introduce myself briefly. I'm primarily the, the host for the evening, and which just means running the conversation. But the reason I'm running this conversation is because this is a topic I'm passionate about. Um, so I'm David Maxson. I'm Emily's wife, uh, wife? student of Greg's husband. wife, husband, <laughs> husband, husband. husband. <laughs> I'm David lawfully Maxson. wedded husband. I'm Emily's lawfully wedded husband. <laughs> yes. Um, so I studied computer science and programming actually long before I went to college. Um, uh, there was a, a group that taught me to code in high school, and then I went off and did the same thing in college, and then I went off and did the same thing in my career. I really love software and everything about it, and I've I've gotten into the fields of artificial intelligence and data science. I like programming. I like multimedia editing. I like doing a video audio editing. I enjoy building, you know, this podcast from behind the scenes. I'm not the thing that makes it tick, but I, I appreciate my small part in it. Known by many more people than than watch this podcast, I make music videos actually. Uh, my top one having over two million views at this point, which Whoa. I'm very proud of. You wow! Know, wow! Irrelevant. Really? Huh. You never mentioned this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's irrelevant. That's, that's, that's cool. Uh, it's not irrelevant. irrelevant. <laughs> we want to know which one it is so that we can become like two million and one, and two million and two, <laughs> and two million and three. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, it leaves me feeling ashamed for not supporting my my subscribers because you know when you build a when you build a following, people kind of expect stuff from you. So mm. anyway. I came to Christ as as a young child, and I, I, I feel like my story differs often from a lot of people who were raised in Christian families, that I I think I really was a Christian at that age. I, I don't remember getting much older and being like having a having a turning around moment. It was at it was on our couch under my mother's teaching and her care. She ran our she taught us scripture in the morning and 
Christ worked on my heart, and I was young enough that I don't really remember any more than that. I certainly spent the next several decades learning what following Christ means and entails and learning the greatness of God's grace by needing it. So we have we have a good God, and, and he brings us through all sorts of circumstances. Amen. So our God is truly awesome in every sense of the word, you know, in, in saving us, but also in in his handiwork, in the way that he's made this universe for us, for us to see, for us to glorify him for. And that's what tonight's about. It's about looking at the awesomeness of God everywhere in the universe, in, in our own minds, in the way we think, in math and logic, in the, the cosmos at, at its magnificent scale and at the subatomic particle and really everything in between. So that's where we're headed. Let's start with um, something nice and simple, which is obscure scientific or mathematical realities that we find fascinating or interesting. So I think, David Lawrence, you had suggested a starting concept. Sure. Uh, I have always been fascinated by the number I for all sorts of crazy reasons. It's, you know, square root of minus one. It shouldn't exist. Uh, by all intents. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so jump in the controversy we'll come back right away. That. That's fine. <laughs> when it's introduced, it shouldn't exist, and yet it explains reality in an amazing way. Um, <laughs> you know, how, do, how does it work? And it's this simple, basic thing. And, you know, it's... E to the I, you know, it describes waves. It describes so many things that we have in the world. Um, I am just, just incredibly fascinated with it. So now tell me why it should exist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, a lot of this comes from our naming conventions in that um, as we started naming the numbers, we started with the natural numbers, the ones we could count on our fingers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and added to that zero, which had a hole in it. So we called those whole numbers. <laughs> and after that, we started doing division with them because at that point we had addition, subtraction, multiplication going, and we added division to the mix, and this created ratios. And for a time, we thought that ratios, fractions, one half, two, three, thirds, three-fourths, 563, 111 48 um, described all the numbers in the universe. And eventually, having laid it out, we began to realize that there were missing gaps. The ratio numbers were called rational numbers, and therefore the numbers that fell in the missing gaps ended up being called irrational rational numbers. No. Not because they weren't reasonable, but because you you know you couldn't build a ratio to make them, and th two of the, I, I'm looking forward to talking about two of those numbers. I, I often refer to them as signature uh, numbers because there are numbers that are kind of like God's credit card. We're <laughs> allowed to use the card; it's got His name on it. It's not ours. It is his. And if we're going to do things, we have to use it. But in God's pleasure, these are numbers that we can understand but not comprehend. <laughs> and differentiating between understand, understand is knowing how to work with something, knowing, knowing its characteristics as it is revealed in the universe. But to comprehend something is to fully know it from every angle. And certain constants like I and pi, we cannot actually write down except as a name. One, two, three, we can write those and we know what they mean. We can, I can comprehend the number one. I cannot comprehend the number pi because I can't even write the thing. <laughs> so when we took those irrational numbers and the rational numbers and we put them together, they formed for us this beautiful number line that had no gaps and we called these the real numbers. These are all names. We called them the real numbers. And so we ended up on a number line going from minus mm -hmm. off towards infinity to plus off towards infinity. And we could advance back and forward, back and forth across this line. But there's something fundamentally missing. I mean, we've described, we have now described all that mathematics can give us in numbers. <laughs> How exactly do you say, as you're advancing backwards and forwards along the number line, how do you say turn left? 
And the thing is, on all of our real numbers, we have no means of instructing a turn. The wheels on the bus do not go round on round. We, there is no rotation. There is simply advance or retreat. You say real with such indignation. <laughs> Be- yes, because our naming convention lacked imagination. Ooh. And we imagined that we had discovered all there was to say about numbers. And then all of a sudden, God threw in our face a two-dimensional number. The, we've been working in one-dimensional numbers, and we thought that one-dimensional numbers were the only numbers that were real. And yet all of a sudden, then we encounter a two-dimensional number, which that's where the square root of minus one pops into this story. Because when you define the square root of minus one, you end up with something that actually turns right off of the number line. But if you keep working with it, it turns back onto the number line. But if you keep multiplying with it, it turns back, it turns around again. And so you get, it starts at one, you multiply by I, you're off the number line um, in a... Uh, orthogonal 90 degree if you want to go degrees um, but you've turned if you're in radians you've turned a full pi radians you multiply again by i you've now turned or actually you turned pi over two radians you but multiply again you've turned pi radians you're now at minus one you keep multiplying and it brings you back around to one Imaginary numbers should never have been called imaginary numbers. They should have been called rotary numbers. Uh And if they had been called rotary numbers, I think people would have had a lot less difficulty wrapping their minds around them. But it's still hard to figure out square root of minus one. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I'll grant you that. Because when you're trying to figure out square root of minus one, you're trying to do something in one dimension that is actually two dimensional. Yep. I like that. I like the explanation. That's great. (sighs) Um, The development of vectors and matrices actually um, came into existence because having discovered a two-dimensional number, we immediately want a three-dimensional number and a four-dimensional number, and we couldn't find one. Um, So we ended up breaking down complex numbers, which are, you know, quote, real and imaginary mixed together, um, into two-dimensional vectors and matrices. And then that allowed us to immediately step into three dimensions, four dimensions, and, you know, there's no limit at that point as far as mathematically what games you want to play. Um, well, complex is a terrible name, too, because it makes everybody think complicated. Yes, and there's a lot of things in the world that are complicated. But <laughs> I, I, I would argue that spinning round and round is pretty complicated because if you put your forehead on a baseball bat and you spin around 10 times, you're going to find it pretty complex <laughs> to be on your feet afterwards. <laughs> I've been um, stealing David's explanation of imaginary numbers for a long time because in algebra, it's always, what are these things? Well... Let, and I talk through exactly what David has said, and they say, "Oh, that's it." So yeah, that's it. it. Pull some of the pull <laughs> some of the mystery away. We're just spinning, you kind of. If you want to know more, you can talk to Mister Farshman when he stops by for pick up his kids or something. But <laughs> right. it, it, does, it does help. So enough bashing on David Lawrence's answer. David Farshman, <laughs> what's 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 your fascinating fact? Well, actually, my fascination, and no, um, it's not bashing on David Lawrence's answer. It's a fantastic answer, and it leads right into my other two um, f- favorite examples, which we've already talked about irrational numbers, and we have two of them um, that are of imminent use, one of which is pi, and the other is three point, which we approximate using decimals. Uh, 3.14159269544, blah, 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 for eternity. And E, which uh, is directly connected to the golden ratio. It's also directly related to, it it, it is the prime um, exponential base for describing how the universe interacts in any kind of cyclic way. Um, And... You can, get, you can find E by taking the limit as N goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over N, all of it raised to the nth power. Wow, and I actually take, remembered that. And, and if you take <laughs> N, if you let N go to infinity, make it infinitely big, and oh, there's something to talk about infinity, then you end <laughs> up, it, it um, the, the number collapses down to E. 
Born mind, blah, 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 something, 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 something. And that goes on forever. Another number that we can understand, we have to understand if we're going to be doing physics, if we're going to be doing any kind of interaction. By the way, I would argue that math and physics are so intimately connected that it's hard. To, I mean, you can't really tease the two apart. Yeah. Um, I would Mathematicians agree. are probably, sp pure mathematicians are spinning in their graves over suggesting that it has, that math needs to be connected to physics, but the, it, the two of them are intimately connected. And if you tear them apart, in my humble opinion, uh, you have stolen, you have sto um, stolen, you have ripped apart body and soul. Um, but with E, you have this, this beautiful exponential number that also people are familiar with from compound interest. And you've got Pi, which we have from taking the uh, circumference and uh, dividing it by its uh, diameter. And pity they didn't just divide by the radius, actually, but that's, that's yeah. another thing altogether. But the amazing thing is you have these three irrational numbers, three numbers that cannot be expressed with fractions. And as Euler pointed out, they form an identity. These three come together um, to form an identity. And that identity is e to the 2 pi i. And e to the 2 pi i, e raised to the power of 2 pi i is 1. And so these three fundamental concepts, these three fundamental constants, which are all actually related, um, even, in, even though they have characteristics that are um, incommunicable between the three. Nevertheless, all three of them share fundamental characteristics related to rotation. And when combined, these three are one. And I find that beautiful. Mm -hmm. and rotation and completely different concepts of thinking. Rotation in number lines, rotation in, in geometric circular space and geometric in or, uh, Rotation in phase or signal spaces. Exactly. And these three in, intimately come together. Um, so that that's my f one of my favorite. If you have to grab one thing that you go, wow, <laughs> that's, that's one. But the world is filled with these kind of wows. And maybe yeah. we'll even talk about infinity tonight because that's kind of cool. Yeah, it is cool. <laughs> uh, Thank you. That's a great you, explanation. I loved it. <laughs> Good, Jeff. Well, I, I am not the mathematician these gentlemen are, for sure. I teach teenagers. If uh, On a good year, I may get to teach them how to do differential and under calculus the way an engineering student learns such things. So I'm not, I really appreciate it. I'm really enjoying what they have to say about these things. I've, I've heard some of it from uh, David Farshman before. It's always fun. I'm going to pick something really simple. One plus one is two. Because as um, a Bible teacher and a sometime theologian, that's a profound statement. It's so easy and simple. And people are constantly saying, see, here's something everybody agrees on. This is neutral ground. How could you possibly yeah. go wrong here? It like, is not neutral. It is now hated because of that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it, that concept of the absolute yeah. truth. First of all, it's an absolute and it's an absolute that strikes at the heart of pantheism because the pantheist should say one plus one is one. So apparently worldview does, does depend upon or does affect how you come to mathematics. And yet oddly, Hindus, we don't go, we don't go to, uh, to India or, or Tibet to study physics. They come to us, to American universities, because our worldview supports mathematics, engineering, and physics, and theirs doesn't. And that's kind of embarrassing and kind of rude of Christians to point this out because, you know, we need to accept everybody. And there's got to be neutrality there someplace. But one plus, one, yeah. But even that, I mean, that that's just the first step. What, we get down to the definitions. What do you mean one plus one is two? Well, that's, that just means what it says. Um, could you explain? Well, if you take one apple and you combine it with one apple, you have two apples. Okay, so now you're making huge assumptions about reality and about epistemology. What do you mean we have this apple? What is an apple? How do we have it? How do we perceive it? Is it in the present? Is it in our memory? Are our memories reliable? How do we know our memories are reliable? How exactly did we check that one out? 
Uh, how do we know the causality holds into the future? That's a huge assumption. Uh, as we're counting these apples, how do we know it's the same apple time and time again as we lo are locked in circular time? But time's linear. This apple oh. is aging. Is it the same apple <laughs> it was before? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then we get into things like this. Uh, so at the very basic level, while the Enlightenment was trying to find neutral ground to stand on in the wake of Newton's discoveries, and saying, here we have, if we could reduce everything to mathematics, then we don't have to argue about what the Bible says and kill each other in religious wars because we found the absolute that's not tied to God, except in the sense that maybe God's a mathematician, the divine geometer who creates the universe with one side of his compasses. But I'm sure he was polite enough to back out after that. Yeah, he may have rigged the program. He may, he may have done the coding for the universe. But surely he does not interfere now. If we can figure out the coding, the mathematical principles, we can take over the program or the universe. Mm -hmm. Oh, we wait. We can be as God. We can be as God. Oh, wait. <laughs> We're stuck in the program. Uh-oh. If there even is a program, and if you can even trust your mind to figure out what it would be and why math works and how, what in the world the connection is between something in your head and the external world, which you don't even know where it came from, or even if it exists because you are trapped out per human Kant inside your own consciousness. So one plus one is two it is an interesting starting point for everybody. What is the matrix? <laughs> yeah, then we go there. Which, by the way, in passing, the, the, the production of the matrix was one of the greatest boons to my teaching ever <laughs> because I used to try to explain Immanuel Kant and couldn't uh, because it was so hot. Now I can just say, have you ever seen the matrix? That, where the mind, the mind creates its own reality and you can all be in it and yet none of it's real. But you'll never know that because all you got are your own sense perceptions recorded in your brain. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we get that. Good. Moving on. <laughs> to simplify things a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the next bullet I had is the theology of math. Do we think that's covered enough or should we, <laughs> should we dive into that as its own thing? Well, if, you, if you'll let me deal with that for a little bit, and then I'm, I'm content to back out for most of the rest of the program and let these guys talk because I would rather listen to them. Okay. Um, we, we come to the Bible and the Bible gives us one God. As the Bible unfolds, we find this God is three persons. Now, mathematics here are interesting. There was a song that one of our teachers presented for review, and it said, one plus one plus one is one. And I had to say, um, no. No. <laughs> one person plus one person plus one person are three persons. Now, if you want to change the labels, one person plus one person plus one person does involve us in one divine being. That's better, but that's still... That, that, that would mean you actually have to teach your, your little kids labeling, which would be great, actually. You have to add, subtract, divide, multiply with labels, with units. That's, that's all mathematicians would appreciate that. Show your work. Label your answers. <laughs> um, but so for, Use the correct units. Use the correct units. And so, you know, you get something similar with Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. No, <laughs> that doesn't even make sense. But, but what we do get is that this one God does exist in three persons, which is to say number is an attribute of God. And to a certain extent, so is basic arithmetic. You, if you talk about uh, the father and then talk about the son, you've added one person to one person in your conversation. And yes, indeed, that's two. There are two persons now you're talking about. And the Holy Spirit, you got three persons. One plus one plus one is three. One plus one is two. If you subtract the Holy Spirit from the conversation, three minus one is two. Basic arithmetic, at the very least, is an attribute of God. Now, the question comes, well, can we then deduce all of uh, analytical geometry, calculus, and number theory from the being of God? I don't know. I kind of doubt it. But that's that's pushing beyond revelation. And when it comes to the nature of God, I'm suspicious. But at the very least, we can see that God is um, finite in the sense that he can be numbered. He is infinite otherwise. There's one God. The number of attributes he has are infinite, uh, as Bavink says in his uh, The Doctrine of God, which which to me, by the way, in passing, was a, was a huge revelation because I always struggled with the systematic theologies that would list half a dozen or so attributes of God and never suggest there might be others. And I began to think, well, where's his creativity? Where's his sense of humor? Where's his sense of the dramatic? Until I finally came across Bavink's comment, well, he's an infinite God. The number of attributes is infinite. Oh, of course. Well, that explains everything, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. I'll, I'll also say... For for the for the deriving mathematics from the nature of God, there's a great book called Godel Escherbach, um, worth worth a read for anyone, um, and it's a good approachable introduction to sort of how mm -hmm. how mathematics gets 
structured from the from the ground up mm -hmm. um, at, at sort of pure logic level. And one one thing that he, he discusses is you know you define your axioms, which is just a fancy word for your assumptions, mm -hmm. your, your presuppositions, and you build everything up on top of that. And so you can, I think as a Christian, we, we can look at God and say, well, there is such a thing as threeness and there's such a thing as oneness. And so mm -hmm. we can sort of, we can work from that and define some axioms and build up a, a concept of reality. And yet we would be overconfident to assume that therefore we've arrived at a full and com comprehensive definition of reality because mm -hmm. you build up Euclidean space, Euclidean space makes sense. Until you scale it up and throw black holes into the mix, and warp, <laughs> well, you you, with, yeah. so you need Euclidean your black holes, David, did you? <laughs> yeah, Euclidean space only yeah. exists in our imaginations. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we teach, we spend years teaching Euclidean space, and we don't live in it, and we have no yeah. examples of it in the universe, yeah. um, except in our imaginations. Or well, the teacher's yeah. whiteboard. Yeah, or so the this, man. <laughs> little yeah, little snapshot. Little yeah. little snapshots because the reality is we're we're dealing with both uh, we're, we're dealing with hyperbolic and parabolic curvatures yeah. we're we're dealing with a much more complex universe than Euclid imagined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's um, not that there is no yeah. reality. The the number line, in a sense, does exist, but so do imaginary numbers. And just because we thought we had comprehended the, the number line, that yeah. didn't mean that we fully comprehended everything there was the danger know. we normally get ourselves in trouble at the point which we when we say we have comprehended this particular concept this particular topic we've got our our hands around it we've wrapped our heads around it we know what we're doing because that's about the time when our the model is going to break because these are all building models of the universe and uh god takes pleasure in preventing our models from becoming idols. Yeah. So God provides both the foundation for knowledge, knowing true things and the infinite unknowable God in the sense that we can't we can't put him in our hands and say this is this is all. The the infinite knowable and unknowable <laughs> but knowable from the standpoint that he's revealed to him yes. revealed himself to us. The the knowable God is incredibly necessary to us because when we're dealing with Kant and if we are being uh, honest and thoughtful, um, if we in insist upon starting with ourselves, we end up cutting ourselves off from the rest of the universe. We can't yeah. actually know that our senses are to be trusted and it's very easy to manipulate them, mess with them and leave us in question as to what is actually there and what is actually true. The heart of communication in Christianity is not that we found God yeah. or that we have been able to deduce from our experiences, our knowledge, what we, there is to know about God. Rather, it is that God has reached out and grabbed us and made himself known to us. And having done that, he has bridged that infinite gap, not only between himself and us, but us and everyone else. It means that our communication, our relationships, our uh, discussions, our arguments are real and reach out beyond the tiny island that is myself. Um, it is the fact that God reached out and communicated to us that makes it possible for us to not be alone and therefore to know something about the rest of the universe, to know that one plus one is two. And walking away from that inevitably undercuts um, the very knowledge that we are trying to hold on to. And we're seeing it today because um, there, the uh, mathematics, the absolute mathematics that people like to refer to when they're trying to create an absolute that is apart from God um, now has become anathema to the woke body of critical race theory. It, it is an act of patriarchal racism to impose such <laughs> things on it because by definition, Christian absolutes must be evil. Being absolute. And so that... And yet um, postmodernism is, is very rational in accepting that once you throw away God, there is nothing, no, there is no firm ground left. 
yeah. at a certain point, um, in order to be consistent to itself, it wraps its mouth around the shotgun barrel and pulls the trigger um, and is proud of itself for having done so. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, uh, when we need to go out and actually do our science papers and, you know, do our work, we have to step away from that. Uh, we have to step away from the villainous desire to get away from God, and we have to simply accept his universe as he's revealed it and start working therein. And most of the time when we run into things in uh, mathematics, for instance, or physics, that seriously shakes our tree and makes us say, no, this cannot be, it is not because it's bigger than God. It's because it's bigger than the little model of the universe and therefore pretty likely the little model that we've made of God. And uh, a little bit of shaking of our tree is a good thing because it reminds us to start draw. We, we draw close to God, not by us building a model of God and drawing close to that model. That's called idolatry. We draw close to God by accepting him as he has drawn close to us and revealed himself in the word of God. So I'd like to jump off on that because you were going towards the word of God. And there's a question I've been curious to ask uh, you all here linking, you know, how does God communicate? He uses word. David, you mentioned the, you know, the tight connection between science and mathematics. And one of the things that another thing I've been fascinated with other than I is <laughs> the wave equation. So, you know, when you're in physics and you, and I, I do not know the wave equation very well. I have some understanding, no comprehension, but I know that it, it describes things. And in fact, when you think in terms of quantum mechanics, it describes an electron. And you try to think, okay, so what is an electron? Is it a wave? Is it a particle? I don't know. But when you write <laughs> down the wave equation, and I, this was when I was uh, first learning physics, it was a big revelation to me to understand the best way to understand electron or you know these types of things is the wave equation. And when you look at it, written down in some language, and it doesn't have to, it, you know, we pick certain symbols, it could be other symbols, but what does it look like? It's a word. And so God has described, I mean, you know, reality is described with words. And I just find that amazing about and how that plays the, out. As you think of the wave equation, what, um, for the sake of argument, in order to, uh, bring everybody onto the uh, same playing field. What is the equation? You can describe it in words, but what is the wave equation <laughs> that you are specifically thinking of in its elements? I, that's the problem. And that's been, I've been long too, uh, long too long in management, so I can't remember the details, but there's differential oh. uh, operators going on and it's, oh yeah, okay. it's describing, you know, the dynamics. Cause of we, got, we got Schrodinger's equations. We've got Einstein's equations of space. We've got a whole bunch of different equations that are right. amazing. Right. And you could thank <laughs> Maxwell's equations, but it was just this idea that you can't, you know, you can't describe what an electron is. We have all these analogies to describe what an electron is, but the, the, the fact when you just say, okay, the best way to describe it are these, this weird is, yeah, word. Are, are these equations that actually describe right. how it performs? These weird before. word that's written down and it's almost like in a minor key. You know, how do we know who God is? It's through his word. Yes. At the end of the day, you can draw whatever analogies you want, but where, at, where do we go? We go to his word. And so word, words are just infused throughout the whole universe in every way, high, low, front, back, everywhere. Um, you know, well, the fact even, we're having this discussion. <laughs> yeah. The fact we're having yeah. this discussion is based on the con it, it inherently implies something that Greg always loved to uh, inculcate, which is truth is propositional rather than leaving 
or rather rowing into Herod's defense or Pilate's defense, which is what is truth? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we're pursuing it. And there's the concept that it can be pursued and captured to some degree. Not all truth, of course, um, because there's only one being, only three persons that have all truth captured. Um, but we have the capacity of capturing some of it because it was God's good pleasure to make us capable of so doing. Right. And, and the fact that we can write some of these words down and have some understanding of the way the reality is out there, and it's a real reality, and it has real effects on the real universe, and we can build spacecraft that go out, <laughs> yes, and they follow the equations, and they hit their target within, you know, a meter of where they're going, and via these funny wave things they send those, those back units information units can be kind of important yes <laughs> those, those units can be kind of important because uh, going no, between I work, uh, with, I work with english JPL. and metric sometimes little mistakes can be made <laughs> yes. and uh, yes. expensive projects can suddenly find themselves decelerating on the face of a planet mm -hmm. <laughs> let me yes, hijack Mars the has a way of doing that doesn't it <laughs> yeah let me uh, hijack the conversation for just a second for people who are may not have followed all that you just said or may be back in Equations or words. One thing that David Farshman has taught, and I've taught a good deal, is that mathematics is a language. I'm like, what? It's got Amen. symbols. It's got this plus and this sin and this cost thing and this you know, funny crosses and hyphens and how is that a word? And and these story problems. What? Those are words. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that the problem with story problems is that it's English? This is something David <laughs> has pointed out to me any number of times. I, and I tell no, the math students, is easy. The English yeah. is hard. Yeah, I, I tell yeah. my students this is on a regular basis. The problem is not math, because once once you get into the symbols, you can do the math. Well, yeah. So your problem is with English. You can't read English. Math is very simple and straightforward, but it is most certainly a language with symbols. They're just symbols that we don't include in our alphabet because we don't use them quite as often as we do A through Z. But it most certainly is a language. It's a mean of, means of communication. You can translate Schrodinger's equation or Maxwell's or Newton's or whoever's into words just fine. You can use the symbols and make it a little more abstract. But all those symbols are, are stand stand in for words. Yep. And so it's 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 about it is a language. It is about words, and it's actually simpler than English because there are twenty million ways to say something in English, and generally there's like one in math. Yeah, and that's <laughs> that. That is the problem, which is why great literature will never be written in algebra. Yeah, <laughs> as, a, as a programmer who often works with code written from original papers, I'll complain in the opposite direction that if you're going to write your code down, use the freaking word that describes what the variable means. <laughs> Don't write down the in your code. Too too much. Too much. Anyway, well, so David Lawrence, you were talking about so the interaction between. You know, these things touch on the real world. We, we think about these, they are words, they are concepts, and yet they describe reality in a way that allows us to interact with the universe around us with precision because we're conforming to it or we're conforming to the, to, to the maker of it as he, as he gave it to us. So there are, there are some occasions where things don't always go as we expect. And you, you, know, you draw your, your orbital equations and say the Earth spins around the sun and has its own rotation. And then, you know, we've got this wonderful thing that allows us to predict exact durations of years and durations. And you've of created days. a multi-body problem that's all of a sudden it's too complex for us to solve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or at least it was until just recently. And, it, you know, it's, it's all very exciting math. And then you read through. And then you discover judges. Neptune and Pluto. <laughs> yeah. well, that too. Wait, um, Pluto doesn't count, does it? Uh, <laughs> oh, and you had a sore spot there. <laughs> Always in our hearts. <laughs> we love you, Pluto. Um, but you read through Judges, you read through Scripture, and axe heads float, and the sun stands still. And these are given to us as historical accounts for us to accept at face value. And we know that metal is not buoyant naturally, and we're not told that there was a bunch of bubbles around it or anything. We know that... <laughs> the earth rotates around the sun and you don't just stop that and people go, you know, if you stop that, people go flying. And yet that's, we're told something about the sun stood still, however that was accomplished. And so you'd mentioned struggling with this in, in college and with your peer group as, 
as being in the physics domain. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about where where your resolution comes down on this? Um, others will be welcome to chip in in a second. But. Sure. Um, when you think that nature is all that there is, it is a it's a it's a challenge. Um, and I you know I mentioned earlier that it was reading C.S. Lewis that helped me uh, when I was in grad school to start to make sense of some of these things. And his book and Miracles, and I'm not going to get all of it right, um, you know, I haven't read it in a couple years, uh, but describing, uh, you know, the laws of the universe, he, he drew the analogy, you know, the laws of the universe are like the laws of mathematics. And, you know, he, people would say, well, gosh, if you have a miracle, how can you break the laws of mathematics? And then, you know, getting back to what David Farshman says, you know, okay, you know, you have two apples or let's say you have some coins in your, in your drawer. And, you know, if you had two, you know, two or three coin, three coins in your drawer, and the next day you look in, there should be three coins there as well. But if there is only two coins there, you're not necessarily breaking the laws of mathematics. You're breaking, as Lewis said, breaking the laws of England because someone came in and stole one. <laughs> <laughs> and so what miracles are like, you're not breaking any laws because in fact, the laws don't give you any real events. God is the feeder of events. And if he so chooses, he can feed an event into the universe at any point in time. Once that event comes in, it follows the laws just as well as any other event. But you don't necessarily, you can't go backwards in time and explain everything because there is a reality outside of things, but it also follows all the laws. And so, you know, the way he described that kind of uh, um, situation, I just, it, it, you know, the key fell into place that you can be a scientist, you can really hold doggedly to the science, and yet, you know, there's realities beyond that, that are fully under the control of the Lord. In teaching this kind of thing to other teachers, when, once at uh, an ACSI convention, Association of Christian Schools International, I, uh, I, I had an early morning session. And just to be difficult, I titled it Fairies and Photons and spelled <laughs> fairy the right way. <laughs> uh, F-A-E-R-I-E. -E. And I got a bunch of young people, young teachers showing up, and I did ask them, okay, how many of you are here this early in the morning? Because the way it's spelled fairy, half the hands went up. Um, but one of the questions I ask in that lecture is, okay, this is a true or false question, and it's a trick question. I'm telling you it's a trick question. Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> true or false, God created the natural laws that run the universe. And of course, what everyone here is God created. And all hands go up. Yes, God created everything. He created the natural laws. I say, no, for a very simple reason. There are no natural laws that run the universe. God runs the universe. This is the biblical doctrine of providence. God runs the universe personally and immediately. He doesn't create some system of laws that mediate between him and the universe. If there's a natural law, what color is it? What shape is it? Where do you find it? Can I see it? Would you introduce me to it? Rather, the laws as we perceive them are, are simply our perceptions of God's covenant faithfulness, his infinite dependability down to the nanosecond and the nanometer and beyond, where God says, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm make the sunrise. There it is. I'm making the sunrise. But it comes up like clockwork. Yes. Aren't I cool? I can do that. Chesterton in uh, Orthodoxy has a chapter where he talks about this sort of thing. Uh, we, we, we think of the sun rising as boring regularity. God sees this as an encore. God is mm -hmm. so pleased with his handwork, he looks at the points of the sun and says, do it again. Oh, that was cool. Do it again. Okay, do it again. Because God delights in what he has done and he promises us, you can think here of uh, Genesis 8 uh, after the flood, that he will be faithful, covenantally faithful, faithful down to the, the place of mathematical equations but we must not confuse our mathematical equations with God's ruling hand. We must simply say, 
we're describing what God does. And boy, our God is faithful. The alternative is, how do you know anything's even out there? And how can you assume anything about the future since you haven't been there and you can't even prove there's a mind-body connection or mind-universe connection in the first place? So Christians are the last ones who need to be ashamed about miracles. As you say, God enters his, enters his ball. It's like the juggler juggling balls. A really good juggler, you can toss a new ball in or you can pick one up and keep the thing going and there's not a slip. Wait, there were three balls. Now there's four. Oh no, this is not possible. He's really good at juggling. Yep. <laughs> God, God's really creative and he can pull something out of nothing and stick it into the mix and not miss a beat. And from, as you say, from that point on, they will continue to follow what we perceive as the laws. Right. That is, God will be faithful. He patterns it into his covenant and it becomes something we can rely on because our God is infinite, infinitely faithful. <laughs> the um, creativity here um, ends up being a uh, rather significant element because God introduces himself as a storyteller. Yep. Admittedly, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was... And, and I just went completely blank. <laughs> um, but he, he then steps into the story and says, let there be light, and there is light. The universe is his story that he's telling. We exist within his imagination. He's real. We're fictitious. However, so great is his imagination that his fiction is our reality. And that reality is, as Greg says, dependable because he's dependable. He's telling his story. Now, if one of the things I noticed a lot growing up, and I have a feeling that the others present here have seen that, was there was a time when uh, we had, uh, you know, six o'clock evening news and everybody would, because there wasn't 24 hour news. And uh, one of the stories that seemed, that seemed to be a perpetual story that would pop up seasonally was coming up with explanations for particular miracles. Um, oh, we have an explanation for the waters of the Red Sea parting. Oh, we have an explanation for, you know, how, you know, the Jordan might have been parted, that sort of thing. Star of David, don't forget and, that one. Oh, Star yeah. of David. <laughs> the point is actually that no, there isn't one. And the reason why it is so popular to hunt down explanations is because they're frantically trying to find out ways that Baal could have done the same thing. Um, we're taking the place, uh, we're trying to take God out of being the providential master of the universe and instead push into the universe masters of power, masters that, you know, we're willing to say run the universe, but are infant that are inextricably part of that universe. Various bales that B-A-A-L, by the way, not B-A-L-E. <laughs> Various bales and ashtoreths that will that we can manipulate, that we can understand, that we in hopefully can comprehend and make our servants. God isn't in the universe. The universe is in him. In him we live and move and have our being, and he's telling a story. And in his story, that story actually is told for his own amusement, not for ours. And therefore, he can span a universe, that a visible universe that's 13.9 you know, billion light years across. And it's like, hey, we can't, there's tons of stuff we can't <laughs> see. It's like, yeah, tough. It's not here for your amusement. The world wasn't created for you to get it, Mr. Burton. Um, the flower I, grows and fades and you never see it. Book a joke. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sorry. It's for his amusement, not ours. And so when it comes to these, these miracles being done, they're being done because the storyteller can say, and then the axe head floated. And guess what? The axe had floated because that's the story. And he just told it. His word defines the story. It also happens to be that his, it is in his immense pleasure to glory in and enjoy in his creation the beauty of structure and the beauty of the understandable, repeatable solution. Uh, and therefore, mathematics, if you're going to understand the universe as God takes the greatest pleasure in constantly running it according to his word, you're going to have to work within 
the mathematics, the physics, that it's his pleasure to take pleasure in. Mm -hmm. uh, and that carries us from algebra through differential equations, through combinatorics, through all sorts of elements of math that give me the heebie-jeebies uh, <laughs> because it's now a study that is vastly bigger than any one individual to uh, learn it all. He is the god of creativity and storytelling who is telling a story of love and wonder, adventure and mystery. And he is telling it in a setting where the story is predictable and therefore encounters dangers to us that makes it exciting and beautiful at the same time. So I think, I think it's fair to, to admit up front that the four of us are nerds. Um, we, <laughs> what? <laughs> Speak for yourself. We, <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we like these things, you know, not, not in their own sakes, not for their own sakes, because we, to, to love anything for its own sake is to ignore the creator behind it, who is, mm. who is the source of that beauty. But we enjoy things that a lot of people find pretty boring. But the reality is that a lot of these things, even, you know, as, as esoteric as either the two pi I might seem, well, why don't you just say one? Well, you know what? If you're building a bridge, you, you use one. If you want a merry-go-round, you're going to use e to the two pi i. <laughs> <laughs> just for convenience. You know, God, God is not bound by these laws that, that would make him small. Um, he these is, are laws to us, not to him. They, they are laws to us. Well, God is a law to us. God's word mm. shapes our reality. And so our conforming to that, our understanding what God will do— uh, because he is a consistent God, is actually really practical. It's it's the foundation upon which we build merry-go-rounds and bridges and computers and make money. I mean, it's the foundation of our job is is knowing how to how to wrangle these skills at a very practical level, founded upon that stability of God. So for the the non-nerds and non-geeks who we probably lost at this point in the episode, but hopefully our listeners can can take this out to the to the real world. Um, oh, the world we're describing is very real. I'm well, yeah. but just the people noting, listening it, it, to us may not be representative of the population. <laughs> <laughs> why are these tools, why is understanding algebra, algebra 2, geometry, physics, chemistry, why are these skills not merely for nerds and geeks, but profitable for whether you want to just go out and make money or whether you want to be the Renaissance man? Hmm. Well, <laughs> um, I would start with the fact that we, each one of us is finite. You're sitting in a chair, you're rocking and moving around in it. Um, you, however, cannot describe to me at the moment the exact um, structure of that chair or the fact that large portions of it go beyond our understanding or our comprehension. If you want to dig down into the subatomic particles just to toss something on the plate. <laughs> We build models that simplify the universe so that we can work with it. The wonder of mathematical and physical models is not their complexity. The wonder is actually their simplicity. Newton described the motion of an object in space under the effect of gravity. And he described it by... Just, describe, just describing the effect of gravity's acceleration. He said, okay, I, I know from the work of other people like Galileo that uh, acceleration is constant. Vertical acceleration is constant. Therefore, why don't I sum up all the vertical accelerations and see what I get out of this? And calculus was him. His, his introduction into calculus was something called integral calculus. He built it. One of those crazy smart guys that the rest of us kind of resent, um, who would just invent whole fields of mathematics over a, an, an evening just because he found it convenient. And he summed up all of those, the effects of that constant acceleration over time and got a simplified sentence that effectively said velocity is equal to acceleration times time. If you start with an object that is not in motion, held above the ground, and you let go, let go of the apple, 
If you know the acceleration, the constant of acceleration, let's say for the sake of argument that it's 32 feet per second per second or 9.8 meters per second, depending on what particular unit of measure you want to be using, and you know how long it falls, you will know what its velocity is. And then he had the idea of summing up um, all of those velocities, because those velocities keep changing. But if we sum up all those velocities, we then find out where the object is, its location in space, it ends up being equal to one half of the acceleration times the time squared plus whatever the, the original velocity was times time plus whatever original location, physical location it was in. Um, starting with a really simplified description, i.e. gravity is a constant, it's a number. He moved to an equation that ended up describing the motion of planets. Uh, he threw out, you know, all sorts of other effects that made the, the universe ununderstandable. And he created this model, this simple model. And it was good enough to be able to describe the motion of the planets around the sun. Um, it was good enough to describe the motion of stars. It was good, of, good enough to, as it were, unify both heaven and the things that we are seeing on Earth. Um, your, our, our first grand unification has been as often as popular to point out. And, but the point of this was coming up with an equation that was simple. It's like, okay, I'm going out, I'm grabbing a baseball, and I'm chucking it, I'm throwing it to my son, and my son catches it. Well, as it happens, your brain is solving differential equations while doing that. It's just not bothering to, you know, show you all the work that it's doing. And if you fail in your calculations in solving your differential equation, you miss the ball. Um, if you're watching in the NFL or you're watching football or you're watching <laughs> baseball, <laughs> you are watching human beings solving differential equations in their heads because that's how it pleases God for the universe to work. Now, if you want to understand it, how important is that? Well, if you raise the stitches on a baseball an eighth of an inch, you completely change its flight characteristics and you're no longer necessarily playing the baseball that, you know, is being played in the American or the National Leagues. Um, the shape of the baseball and the size of the stitches of leather that hold it together affect the aerodynamics. How much does it matter? Well, clearly millions of dollars depend <laughs> on it. Um, the same thing is true of the football. The same thing is true of that ellipsoidal ball that they play with in the <laughs> NFL. Um, and don't forget the golf ball. And oh my goodness, no. and the golf ball, which does not follow um, the simple <laughs> path because of all those little dimples. So... On the one hand, we can say, well, if I don't want to understand the universe and don't want to describe exactly how it behaves, I don't need to know these things. And you're right. Um, you don't need to know how your car works to drive it. But you do need to pay someone who knows how the car works to fix it and to care for it. And um, the people that are willing to put out the effort to learn that portion of God's universe... Um, are appreciated in one form or another. Often they're paid well. And we shouldn't be pursuing money as a god. Um, it's simply a representation of the fact that the knowledge has value of goods and services. And therefore, the nerdiness of our discussion is when I'm making reference to obscure movies from the 80s. <laughs> um, like the reference, the world is not here for you to get it, Mr. Burton, um, is uh, Big Trouble in Little China. Um, that's nerdy in the extreme. <laughs> but the mathematics, the language of how the world works isn't nerdy, it's artistic. Art is hard really crazy, crazy hard. And um, if you're going to do it well, you have to study. Uh, and that's why universities exist um, with mathematics and physics programs and chemistry programs and engineering programs. 
And uh, I'll tell you, if you don't want to know how the universe works exactly and you're feeling lazy, you can, you can reduce what you're working with the way Caltrans does. And instead of using differential equations to solve the requirements for building bridges, they use algebra and then multiply values by 10. It's more expensive, but it's easier <laughs> for the engineer. I'm not joking. I have a friend that works for Caltrans who's an engineer and tells me exactly how they do these things. And it curls my toes because my mathematic self is offended. It's for called those Martin. of you who do not know. For those we of you do that do not for know, space flight Caltrans. too, by the way. Oh, California Transport. Yeah, the yeah. people responsible for building roads in California. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know how much longer we have, but I do want to insert something that's very important um, because we're talking about Christianity and yet the name of Jesus has not come up very much. We've, we've hinted at the Logos, the divine word, who by his wisdom and power structures the universe. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the gospel. What we saw up front in our earlier discussion was the need for the gospel. With regard to mathematics and physics, why do we need the gospel? Because normally we distort reality. We hate reality. We hate one plus one is two. We, we, we want to rewrite the science. And I'm not just talking about evolution versus creation. I'm talking about the rationality of science. Mm -hmm. and, and David uh, Farshman mentioned some of the, 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 the play that postmodernism and critical race theory has been doing with this. It is our nature to hate God's reality. It is our nature to hate the image of God within us and to try to stamp out any vestiges of it. And so left to itself, a society will turn its back on mathematics and science. And we will end up with magic. David was describing Baalism. Baalism is simply a fancy word, Bible's word for a sorcerer society where we use uh, amulets and spells to manipulate the forces of nature, which are impersonal, but can be frightened, coerced, nudged into doing our bidding. But only the experts in the white coat, I'm sorry, that's science. Um, only, the the, <laughs> only the priesthood knows these rules. And if we want good crops, fertile bodies for our wives, we have to offer them the sacrifices that they insist on, even if it be our own children. And you end up with a magical society that has no room for science. No concept of future improvement. No but a claim of, of owning science. Yeah, yeah. They, they own worship it. it they worship it, and the rest of us don't know it anything. It is not what the science we know. Yeah, it's, it becomes more and more its own arcane, esoteric field of knowledge. And while civilization and culture crash dive, and we end up with what we today call third world countries, or far worse, the what we used to call primitive people who live in the jungles of the Amazon or Papua New Guinea or something. They're not primitive, they're retrograde. They fell from the high state that man had when Noah stepped off the ark uh, from the admin scientific knowledge that within a couple of generations would build the pyramids to a point where they're afraid of trees because there's spirits in them. And the scary thing is there may be spirits in them. We return to the demonic. And the way out of this descent into magic and demonism is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Until we are humbled by the Holy Spirit, by the preaching of the word, to turn from our rebellion and our idolatry and it would be autonomy and trust Jesus Christ to save us from sin and therefore from all levels of rebellion, including intellectual rebellion. That's the course civilization takes and history has proved it over and over again. The only rescue for a culture is not external force or new discoveries or new technology it's coming to terms with God in Christ, or rather God coming to coming to us with terms in Christ and by his spirit subduing our heart to those terms so that we trust and believe uh, of his free grace. And so when we're talking, so what does Christianity have to do with science? Well, if you want to have it for a few more generations, everything. Not only is God the creator and the one who providentially rules the world faithfully and has told us about these things in his word. He's also one who saves us from our rebellion when we want to say, yeah, that may be so, but I don't want to believe it. So I'm going to go do weird stuff in my head. And I, nah, 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 one plus one is anything I want. You can't make me. Yeah, well, yeah, actually you can because, yeah, <laughs> as Lewis might say, try stepping up a skyscraper and see if you've repealed the law of gravity. God's covenant patterns tend to be very, destructive if we don't submit ourselves to his lordship. And thus, Christianity, the gospel, come to Christ. 
because in it in him is sanity in him is order and covenant faithfulness in him is understanding and wisdom he is the god the logos who structures reality and so as we finish out our discussion just want to make sure that that's on the table that we don't leave without having said that because otherwise we, we can be accused of a new form of unitarianism or right. or deism or something where god sits back and provides us answers but you don't really have to be a Christian. You don't really need Jesus. Uh, yeah, 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 you do. You do. You do. Absolutely. Amen. 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 I think I'll, I'll close with my with the last question I had uh, prepared, which is how in our in our individual careers, I think this is mostly pointed at the other two Davids who have right. mathematical scientific careers. How do you depend upon the nature of God, the word of God to do your daily work? And if, if you want to tie in particular scriptures that have helped to inspire you down those paths, um, feel free to throw that in. The scriptures that I would say are not necessarily related to the science. It's related to the people that one works with. And, uh, you know, you also had some potential questions there about, you know, community and the science. It's done with people. People are messy. I've been going through Proverbs a lot recently, and that has been, you know, a huge encouragement um, because when, you know, when you're doing science, you have uh, egos that are involved. You have people that are very difficult, including myself. Um, and so being regulated, being reminded, being pulled back to who we are in Christ, to uh, how, you know, how do we live in our everyday life? I mean, that's, you, you know, for the daily work, that's what I'm doing. And what's interesting, that's not different than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so us scientists, we are no different. We're just doing the work that's set before us. Uh, and just as everyone else is. And um, coming in on that, uh, not just working with the trouble of other people, I'll tell you the trouble of working with myself. Um, <laughs> I am a sinner saved by grace, by God's grace, saved by Jesus Christ. And as I labor, I can look at what I'm doing and say in the overall grand scheme of things of the universe, exactly how important and relevant is this? And uh, apart from uh, amusing myself and feeding my family, and you know, we can always look for grander, screen, grander schemes and elements, but you know, it's not uncommon that I have students that are taking the class, taking a a class whose sole goal is to get through this class with the expectation that they'll never use the knowledge again. <laughs> um, and whether I be working or I be laboring, what or they, what they're doing with the people that I'm working with, what, where does the value come? Why do I keep going? Why can't I keep going? And it's a twofold answer. One, I labor as unto the Lord because that gives value to what I'm doing. Quite honestly, he doesn't need a single thing that I produce. Um, I can't produce anything that God doesn't already have. And therefore, all I am is a pathetic little creature offering back shreds of what he has given me. Nevertheless, the meaning is found in the fact that he takes pleasure in, in my doing so because his son has saved me. My labors are offered to God through Jesus Christ. And in so being offered, they are ennobled by the one through whom they are offered. Secondarily, when I despair in myself, I find my comfort in my Savior. Because whereas I fail, he does not. And uh, there are many times in the day that I need to remind myself that Jesus is enough and that all the little petty things that try to pull me away in different directions are simply distractions. And as far as me being able to work productively, teach productively, knowing that Christ has saved me, allows me to rest in him 
and it makes my work easy. <laughs> <laughs> so I do not know if that answers your question specifically, because um, if asking how do you how does the word of God apply to mathematics? <laughs> we could be here for a very long time. We could be charging through Proverbs where God is um, declaring his hatred for bad math and bad physics, um, implying that there's good math and good physics. Unequal um, weights and measures. <sighs> unequal exactly. weights and measures, which defines that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, but in the reality is in my day to day walk, um, it is the words of Christ and the words of God that hold me together and give me comfort and joy and pleasure to go back to work every day. Amen. Let Amen. me um, let me pick up a theme here. <laughs> this will take a couple of minutes. The program we the podcast is called Halting Towards Zion. And what you two gentlemen have just described is really in many ways the heart of what that title's getting at. Mm. Halt means a limp. The New Jerusalem's in the future, and yet its suburbs stretch into time, into the now. We have come to Mount Zion. And so what you've described, learning mathematics, teaching mathematics, feeding your family, being sanctified in your relationship with other people, working in community, community, city, these are things that, that are eternal. Uh, on a very simple level, math is eternal, guys. Um, audience, math isn't going away when you get to heaven. We're good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> my, my wife just screamed no in the background. He didn't hear. It. Uh, <laughs> uh, calculus is forever. You know, biology may change. Morticians will be out of a job. Doctors we won't need. But mathematicians, it's 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 there. So we are learning. You know, some of the debates about eschatology. Does anything from this world carry over into the next? Well, we don't suddenly get stupid. So math will still be there, and everything we've learned here is something we will put into application in the redeemed creation. Uh, but more to the point, I think, and, and I, I was so happy to see both of you go there, is the area of sanctification, both personally, which is what David Farshman emphasized, and communally, which is what David Lawrence emphasized. Uh, as we work on science, we work on our sanctification, our growth in grace, our walk with Christ. Now, this would have been true in some sense, even in an unfallen world. We still have to learn to work together, submit to one another. Jesus, in his perfect innocency, yet learned obedience by the things he suffered. That is, solving a differential equation, even in an unfallen world, is challenging, requires focus, and requires you to listen to other people. In an unfallen world, that would all be a joy and a bliss. In a fallen world, not so much. And God makes it harder to grow us more. And he makes us work together with people who are stubborn and proud and don't listen, and with ourselves who are proud and stubborn and don't listen, so that we can learn more about this process of community that will be fully manifested in the New Jerusalem when it appears in all of its glory. So these are things that are eternal. We grow now in a way we can't grow later because now we fight against sin. When Jesus comes and the resurrection comes, we won't be fighting against sin. There'll still be room for a sort of growth and maturity, and certainly in knowledge. But the kind of trusting Christ in the midst of adversity and of our own sinfulness, that's a now opportunity that will breed fruit mm -hmm. through all eternity. And so we, we, we say, I'm just feeding my family. I'm just teaching some kids who don't want to learn. That's, there's some truth in that, but that's not all truth. All of this is building blocks in the New Jerusalem. And we see that by faith. We can't see it with the eye, but one day we will. And so in the mean, uh, to look at it in a different direction, Reformed theologies sometimes struggle with dominion mandate, cultural mandate, whatever you call it, Great Commission, as if these were two different things. From the beginning, people would grow in, in faith and, and grace and maturity, again, even in an unfallen world, through hard, practical stuff like learning math or building buildings or roads or gardening or farms. Uh, domesticating animals. That's, you don't, as reformers, we should know this. You don't become holy by going on a mountaintop and contemplating your navel. You do it by interacting with the physical world, both physically, your hands, and mentally, your mind, and emotionally with your heart. And now that sin's in the world, we have to do all that, but now we need the redemptive grace of God in Christ. We need the gospel. So the gospel moves us to these things, enables these things, and yet in the process of doing these things, we're brought into hard situations where, as you, you have said, we're thrown back on Christ. 
So we come, ag come against the problems, whether it's the mathematical equation or the people we have to get along with or our own failings. And it throws us back on God. It throws us back on redemption, upon the gospel. And so this isn't something that's an add-on or attack on to Christianity or to the gospel. This is how God always meant for people to grow. And this is how the gospel means for us to grow. Give us hard stuff to do and let it shake out our sins so that we look at Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. So I Amen. thank you all for, for this, uh, this conversation this evening. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I wanted to, to talk about, you know, science and things. And, you know, th this is, this is one bottomless domain of beauty. This is one, one way of perceiving God. And while there's, there is fundamental utility here, you know, not everybody's going to go off and become a scientist, but whatever, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord, this, mm -hmm. whatever you, whatever study you take, whatever pursuit you, you, you aim for, pour your heart into it and, and recognize the beauty in all these, in all these different domains. You know, we're scientists and mathematicians, but we also do storytelling and farming and entertainment and teaching. And, you know, there, there, there's beauty in, every angle and everything that God has given us to do. Amen. Amen. Yep. And nothing says we can't do this again sometime. Yeah, we've only scratched the surface here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, when, I'm teaching a, when I'm teaching a math class, I get to have these kind of conversations for an entire semester. Oof. Um, <laughs> and yeah, this, we only touched like a tiny portion of one of those conversations. There's so much to talk about. And it's a, it's a real honor to... Uh, get to speak with the group of you so thank you well thank you yes. i i i enjoyed it immensely so cool. much appreciated and so did i i this yep. this is great this is great we will do it again Tell uh, thank I, you I, I, I'm, I'm bummed we didn't get to neutron stars but maybe next time yeah maybe next time that would be fun yeah. How about just neutrons? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just just talking about the concept of a a an, a subatomic particle, for lack of a better term, um, a quanta that occupies that that is in many places at the same time <laughs> is is uh, there's tons of room for conversation in this. oh yeah that <laughs> occupies space but then what about black holes yeah <laughs> yeah yeah well, this is one yeah, where i would sit back and listen a lot <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's wrap up there for the evening um okay. thank you to all of our listeners um if you want to follow more um subscribe to the podcast we are everywhere that podcasts can be found uh, if you find podcasts someplace and we're not there, please tell us. We'd love to be everywhere podcasts are found. We have a Facebook page, Halting Towards Zion. Feel free to like us and follow us. Share us. That's a great way to, to spread this if you think other people are interested. All of our episodes are linked up there as well as show notes. As you may know, we're on a little bit of a special spree at the moment. We're releasing every other week. We will be back soon, at least beginning of July. When we do come back, I do intend to have an actual webpage, so... Hold, hold your breath for that one. Cool. If you'd like to leave us a review somewhere, you can leave us a review on iTunes, on Spotify, on Facebook. Um, and finally, if you have questions, please email us at holtingtowardszion at gmail.com. Uh, we don't always do a great job of replying and letting you know that we got the emails, but we do always get the emails, and we will either answer them as soon as possible or reply back. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. 